structure, sign, and play in the discourse of the human sciences French, la structure, la signe et le jeu dans le discours des sciences humaines was a lecture presented at Johns Hopkins University on 21 October 1966 by philosopher Jacques Derrida. The lecture was then published in 1967 as Chapter 10 of Writing and Difference French, l'écriture et la différence. Structure, sign, and play identifies a tendency for philosophers to denounce each other for relying on problematic discourse, and argues that this reliance is to some degree inevitable because we can only write in the language we inherit. Discussing the anthropology of Claude Levi Strauss, Derrida argues that we are all bricklers, creative tinkerers who must use the tools we find around us. Although presented at a conference intended to popularize structuralism, the lecture is widely cited as the starting point for post-structuralism in the United States. Along with Derrida's longer text of grammatology, it is also programmatic for the process of deconstruction. Topic. Colloquium Derrida wrote, Structure, Sign, and Play, to present at a conference titled, the Language of Criticism and the Sciences of Man", held at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore from 18–21 October 1966. The conference, organized by Richard A. Maxey for the newly founded Humanities Center, and sponsored by the Ford Foundation, brought together a collection of notable French thinkers, including Paul de Man, Roland Barthes, Jean Hippolyte and Jacques Lacan. Michel Foucault was, in the words of Jean-Michel Rabaté, notoriously absent. Derrida reportedly wrote his essay rather quickly in the 10 or 15 days preceding the conference. According to one report, Derrida was a last-minute replacement for anthropologist Luc de Hoche. Many attendees came from France, and spoke French during the event. French lectures were translated into English and distributed in print. Derrida's lecture was listed in the program and delivered in French, as La structure, la signe et le jeu dans le discours des sciences humaines. Lacan was one of the few French attendees to lecture in English. Lacan makes a point of this gesture at the beginning of the lecture, titled, Of structure as the inmixing of an otherness prerequisite to any subject whatever. Structure, sign, and play was first published in English in 1970, within a volume dedicated to the Johns Hopkins Colloquium titled The Structuralist Controversy, The Languages of Criticism and the Sciences of Man. Maxi and Donato write in the preface to this volume that the goal of the conference was to clarify the field of structuralism and define some of its common problems across disciplines. Topic. Content Structure, Sign, and Play discusses how philosophy and social science understand structures abstractly. Derrida is dealing with structuralism, a type of analysis which understands individual elements of language and culture as embedded in larger structures. The archetypal examples of structuralism come from Ferdinand de Saussure, who showed how phonemes and words gain meaning only through relations with each other. Derrida dealt directly with Saussure in a related book titled Of Grammatology. The main object of this text is Claude Levi Strauss, whose structuralist anthropology analyzed the relationships between elements of cultural systems such as mythology. Derrida admires the reflexivity and abstract analyses of structuralism, but argues that these discourses have still not gone far enough in treating structures as free-floating, or playing, sets of relationships. In particular, he accuses structuralist discourses of holding on to a center 
a privileged term that anchors the structure and does not play. Whether this center is God, being, presence, or man, as it was at the colloquium, its function is the same, and the history of structures is a history of substitutions, one center after another, for this constant position. Derrida suggests that this model of structure will end is ending and that a newer and freer, though still unknown, thinking about structures will emerge. Topic. An event has perhaps occurred. The essay begins by speculating, perhaps something has occurred in the history of the concept of structure that could be called an event, if this loaded word did not entail a meaning which it is precisely the function of structural structuralist thought to reduce or suspect. The event involves changes in structuralism, structure, and in particular, the structurality of structure, which has hitherto been limited, writes Derrida, through the process of being assigned a stabilizing center. The center is that element of a structure which appears given or fixed, thereby anchoring the rest of the structure and allowing it to play. In the history of metaphysics specifically, this function is fulfilled by different terms, which Derrida says are always associated with presence. Eidos, arche, telos, energia, ousia, essence, existence, substance, subject, aletia, transcendentality, consciousness, or conscience, God, man, and so forth. Whichever term is at the center of the structure, argues Derrida, the overall pattern remains similar. This central term ironically escapes structurality, the key feature of structuralism according to which all meaning is defined relationally, through other terms in the structure. From this perspective, the center is the most alien or estranged element in a structure, it comes from somewhere outside and remains absolute until a new center is substituted in a seemingly arbitrary fashion. The center, therefore, is not the center. The event under discussion is the opening of the structure, which became inevitable when the structurality of structure had to begin to be thought and the contradictory role of the center exposed. The result of the event, according to Derrida, must be the full version of structural free play, a mode in which all terms are truly subject to the openness and mutability promised by structuralism. Derrida locates the beginning of this process in the writings of earlier philosophers, who continued to use the pattern of metaphysics even as they denounced it in others. Topic. Reciprocal destroyers Derrida depicts Nietzsche, Freud, and Heidegger, three of his greatest influences, as ultimately trapped within a destructive spiral of denunciation. Nietzsche questioned the power of representation and concepts to really convey truth, Freud challenged the idea that mind was limited to consciousness, and Heidegger criticized the idea of being as presence. Derrida argues that these theoretical moves share a common form. But all these destructive discourses and all their analogues are trapped in a sort of circle. This circle is unique. It describes the form of the relationship between the history of metaphysics and the destruction of the history of metaphysics. There are many ways of being caught in this circle. They are all more or less naive, more or less empirical, more or less systematic, more or less close to the formulation or even to the formalization of this circle. It is these differences which explain the multiplicity of destructive discourses and the disagreement between those who make them. It was within concepts inherited from metaphysics that Nietzsche, Freud, and Heidegger worked, for example. 
Since these concepts are not elements or atoms and since they are taken from a syntax and a system, every particular borrowing drags along with it the whole of metaphysics. This is what allows these destroyers to destroy each other reciprocally. For example, Heidegger, considering Nietzsche, with as much lucidity and rigor as bad faith and misconstruction, as the last metaphysician, the last Platonist. One could do the same for Heidegger himself, for Freud, or for a number of others. And today no exercise is more widespread. Derrida does not assert the possibility of thinking outside such terms. Any attempt to undo a particular concept is likely to become caught up in the terms which the concept depends on. For instance, if we try to undo the centering concept of consciousness by asserting the disruptive counterforce of the unconscious, we are in danger of introducing a new center. All we can do is refuse to allow either pole in a system to become the center and guarantor of presence. Topic: Levi Strauss. Having described a pattern, denouncing metaphysics while relying on it, in discourses about metaphysics, Derrida suggests consideration of the same pattern within the human sciences, whose subjection to the critique of ethnocentrism parallels the destruction of the history of metaphysics in philosophy. Derrida argues that, just as philosophers use metaphysical terms and concepts to critique metaphysics and criticize the use of these concepts by others, the ethnologist accepts into his discourse the premises of ethnocentrism at the very moment when he is employed in denouncing them. He examines the work of Claude Levi Strauss, particularly as it concerns the opposition between nature and culture, as his case study and primary focus for the essay. Topic. Bricolage Derrida highlights Levi Strauss's use of the term bricolage, the activity of a bricoler. The bricoler, says Levi Strauss, is someone who uses the means at hand, that is, the instruments he finds at his disposition around him, those which are already there, which had not been especially conceived with an eye to the operation for which they are to be used and to which one tries by trial and error to adapt them, not hesitating to change them whenever it appears necessary. Bricolage becomes a metaphor for philosophical and literary critiques, exemplifying Derrida's previous argument about the necessity of using the language available. The bricoler's foil is the engineer, who creates out of whole cloth without the need for bricolage. However, the engineer is merely a myth since all physical and intellectual production is really bricolage. Topic. Structure and myth Derrida praises Levi Strauss for his insights into the complexities, limitations, and circularities of examining a culture from the outside in order to classify its mythological system. In particular he praises Levi Strauss's recognition that a mythological system cannot be studied as though it was some finite portion of physical reality to be scientifically divided and conquered. Derrida quotes Levi Strauss's The Raw and the Cooked. In effect the study of myths poses a mythological problem by the fact that it cannot conform to the Cartesian principle of dividing the difficulty into as many parts as are necessary to resolve it. There exists no veritable end or term to mythical analysis, no secret unity which could be grasped at the end of the work in decomposition. The themes duplicate themselves to infinity. When we think we have disentangled them from each other and can hold them separate, it is only to realize that they are joining together again, in response to the attraction of unforeseen affinities. In Derrida's words, 
structural discourse on myths mythological discourse must itself be mythomorphic levi strauss explicitly describes a limit to totalization and at the same time the endlessness of supplementarity Thus Levi Strauss, for Derrida, recognizes the structurality of mythical structure and gestures towards its free play. But Derrida criticizes Levi Strauss for an inability to explain historical changes for describing structural transformation as the consequence of mysterious outside forces, paralleling the substitute centers that make up the history of metaphysics ultimately derrida perceives in levi strauss a sort of ethic of presence an ethic of nostalgia for origins an ethic of archaic and natural innocence of a purity of presence and self-presence in speech arguing that this structuralist thematic of broken immediateness is thus the sad, negative, nostalgic, guilty, Rousseauist facet of the thinking of free play of which the Nietzschean affirmation the joyous affirmation of the free play of the world and without truth, without origin, offered to an active interpretation would be the other side. True free play, argues Derrida, actually undoes this certainty about presence. Free play is the disruption of presence. The presence of an element is always a signifying and substitutive reference inscribed in a system of differences and the movement of a chain. Free play is always an interplay of absence and presence, but if it is to be radically conceived, free play must be conceived before the alternative of presence and absence, being must be conceived of as presence or absence beginning with the possibility of free play and not the other way around. Derrida concludes by reaffirming the existence of a transformation within structuralism, suggesting that it espouses this affirmative view of unlimited free play and presenting it as unpredictable yet inevitable. Topic. Influence The 1966 colloquium, although intended to organize and strengthen the still murky field of structuralism became known through Derrida's lecture as a turning point and the beginning of the post-structuralist movement. Derrida acknowledged the influence of the Hopkins colloquium, writing in 1989. It is more and more often said that the Johns Hopkins colloquium the languages of criticism and the sciences of man was in 1966 more than 20 years ago an event in which many things changed it is on purpose that i leave these formulations somewhat vague on the american scene which is always more than the american scene what is now called theory in this country may even have an essential link with what is said to have happened there in 1966. Scholars attempting to explain the success of Derrida's presentation have argued that it fit well with the current of radicalism developing in the United States. The essay sowed the seeds of popularity for French post-structuralism at Eastern universities in the United States, particularly Johns Hopkins, Cornell, and Yale. Derrida also returned several times to the Hopkins Humanities Center, the faculty of which still credits his influence. The colloquium also created a demand for the French intellectuals on American campuses, which led notably to Derrida's 1986 recruitment by University of California, Irvine. Topic. Criticism. The colloquium came under scrutiny from the new journal Telos when, in 1970, Richard Moss published an article criticizing its sponsors and denouncing it as an agent of multinational capitalism. Derrida, in particular, drew criticism from Marxists such as Frederick Jameson who called deconstruction overly intellectual and distant from class struggle. The New York Times argued in its obituary for Derrida that, "...structure, sign, and play," 
offered professors of literature a philosophical movement they could legitimately consider their own. Topic. See also Difference Postmodernism <laughs>